Let's stand and bless the name of the Lord. I will bless the name of Jesus.
I'm Daniel Watson, pastor of First Assembly of God in Howell, Oklahoma. We are a local church with a worldwide vision of reaching out to people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the next few minutes, we want to reach out to you through the messages preached in this broadcast. As you watch this message, we pray that God will speak to your heart and that your life will be forever changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Well, if you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to John chapter 12. <coughs> John chapter 12. This is our 17th study on the Gospel of John. And we are also doing another study on uh, some of the uh, books that John has written through the power of the Holy Spirit, the book of Revelation, on Sunday nights. And we encourage you to bring people with you on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Those who do not have a home church, we invite them to come and be a part. But tonight we are in John chapter 12, and we will be reading verses 1 through 8. John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. The Bible says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold? for 300 pence, and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying she has kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. In the previous chapter of John chapter 11, Jesus had raised Lazarus of Bethany from the dead. This was a miracle that God, uh, this was a miracle of God which created quite a stir, not only among the, the, the Jewish population, but among those who were the religious leaders, the priests and the Pharisees. Well, at this time, Jesus is nearing the end of his public ministry here on earth. And the Bible tells us that after raising Lazarus from the dead, that Jesus knew the priests and the Pharisees were planning his death. And because of that, Jesus was no longer walking openly among the Jews. And instead, John chapter 11 verse 54 tells us that Jesus went to the city of Ephraim, which is a city near the wilderness. So we are now six days before the Passover. This is the time when Jesus would host the Last Supper right before the crucifixion. Jesus had returned to the city of Bethany where Lazarus had been raised from the dead. He was taking a time of rest, a time of refreshing, a time of fellowship with his disciples. Everyone needs a time to rest. They need a place to relax and enjoy fellowship of friends and family. And this is especially true for people who are working in a full-time ministry such as Jesus was. And, and Jesus on this occasion was at the home of Simon the leper. And the Bible tells us that Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus of Bethany were there along with the disciples of Jesus. Jesus was soon going to be on his way to die on the cross of Calvary. He knew that in just a few short days that he would face the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Bible says that Jesus prayed so hard and so much anguish upon his life that the blood would begin to pour from his face, mixing with the sweat and falling to the ground as great drops of blood. And immediately the Bible tells us that Jesus would be facing the shame and the suffering of the death of the cross on the hill of Golgotha, also known as Calvary's Hill. And it's here in, in John chapter 12 that we find Jesus coming to the home of his friends to find a few hours of encouragement and fellowship and support from his disciples and the majority which Jesus knew was going to desert him during his darkest hour. And although this passage of scripture is given to us in the form of a historical narrative, it's nonetheless a sense of instruction to us as well. These are verses that teach us how to bring honor to Jesus. And, and there are three things about honoring Jesus that we can gather 
from this text. The first thing is that we are to honor Jesus in our home. Notice how Jesus was welcomed in the home of Simon the leper. This was a place where Jesus' friends were. It was a place where he felt welcome. And it was a place where Jesus could spend some time and rest. It is no doubt that at times in Jesus' earthly life and on the humanity side of Jesus that he would grow weary and he looked forward to these times of rest and peace. And here we have a home in which Jesus was now the honored guest. Now something we should ask ourselves is how welcome is Jesus in our home. There are many so-called Christian homes in this world today that Jesus would not be that comfortable if he was invited to their home. Things that are watched on television, words that are used, the attitudes that people display, the things that are said would be offensive to Christ and would grieve his spirit. See, there are many homes today where Jesus would be like an outsider if he was invited into their home. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should strive to have a home where Jesus would always be the unseen guest. We should strive to live the kind of life in, in private that could be viewed publicly without any sense of embarrassment or shame. If we are to honor Jesus, that means making Jesus Christ the Lord or Master of our home. If Jesus was to come to our house today, would He feel right at home? That means we would not have to spend hours getting rid of things or hiding things that we would be ashamed of for Him to see. It means that there is no room or no closet or drawer or, or cupboard anywhere in your house that Jesus could not go and look through. It means that Jesus would have free reign to go wherever He wanted inside of your house because you would have nothing to hide. We need to honor Jesus. Honoring Jesus in our home means that Jesus would feel comfortable watched what we watched. Jesus would feel comfortable listening to the music that we listened to and, and joining in our conversations and reading our books and, and, and going through our library. Honoring Jesus in our home means that His presence is always taken into account. Regardless of what we're doing in life, we live our life as though Jesus is standing right here watching our every move. See, when we honor Jesus, that means we live according to His Word. That means we are obedient to the commandments of the Word of God. For husbands, when we honor Jesus in our home, that means that we treat our wives with respect. We treat our wives with love that she deserves according to the Word of God. Because wives are a gift from God and they're our sister in the Lord as one whom the Spirit of God dwells. We honor Jesus in our home when we love her like we should. And for wives, loving Jesus in our home means that you love your husbands as the Word of God teaches. See, it does not mean that a wife is to be a doormat, but instead a wife is a partner. A wife is a suitable fit for her husband's needs. It means that she allows her husband to be the spiritual leader and she follows his leading and his guidance. She follows him and respects him as the head of the house. It means that she shows some respect. And for children, children honor God by honoring their parents. See, when we honor Christ in our home, that means the family is in unity. If we expect to be in unity with God, then we must be in unity with each other. That means children submit to their parents' authority. The husband and wife, uh, they submit to each other and they become one. They're in agreement with each other according to the word of God. So Jesus was the welcome guest of honor at the house of Simon the Lamb. He needs to be the welcome guest of honor in our houses as well. And when we look at this text in John chapter 12, it teaches us that we are to honor Jesus in our home. We are to honor Jesus in our life. But if we are going to honor Jesus in our home, we must, we must first honor Him with our heart. We must honor Him in our hearts. Notice verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, There they made Him, speaking of Jesus, they made Him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. 
So here we find three different people. We have Mary, we have Martha, and we have Lazarus. Now keep in mind, this is the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead, as we saw in last Wednesday night's message. Now it's interesting also to note that each of these followers of Jesus had a different passion. They had a different disposition of their heart. They had a different style of worship that they choose to bring honor to Jesus. Now the first person that we see in this text is Martha. The Bible tells us that, that they had made a supper for Jesus and that Martha was the one that was serving it. If you go throughout the Word of God, you will find this picture of Martha as a woman who is cooking, she is serving, she's giving the best of her heart to God through the gift of hospitality. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, we also see another example of Martha's desire to serve God to the highest extent. Martha has been nicknamed, in a sense, as a worried housekeeper. She was a perfectionist. She wanted everything to be perfect. When Jesus was coming to her house, she wanted the best food. She wanted the house to be clean. She wanted everything to be done the best that it possibly could be done. And so since Jesus was the guest of honor in her home, she wanted everything to be just perfect. And she wanted everyone to be on board to make sure that it was right. I want to tell you, you don't want to be standing around when there is a woman in the house doing all of the cooking and all the cleaning and all the housework. You know why? Because if you keep standing around, sooner or later, she's going to put you to work. And all the wives said, Amen. Amen. Someone's been there. See, she's going to put us to work because it's not just her job. But Martha was the same way. If she saw someone out there just sitting, she would put them to work. See, for Martha, honoring Jesus meant serving Him. Doing the things that she loved to do, which she loved to cook. She loved to serve. She loved to host people in her home. And so, the next person that we see mentioned is Lazarus. Now, the Bible tells us that Lazarus was one of those that was reclining in the table with Jesus. Now, for some people, it would be easy to assume uh, something negative in this text and call Lazarus lazy, but that would be uh, a misunderstanding. See, there's a specific reason in the Word of God that Lazarus is reclining at the table with Jesus. While Martha is serving Jesus by preparing food and keeping the house clean, Lazarus wants to have fellowship with Jesus. Lazarus wants to talk with Jesus and ask him questions and, and listen to him speak. He wanted to enjoy every minute that he had with the Master. Many times when I have been to a, a family reunion or a, a large gathering, even uh, when we have church dinners here, there is a comparison to what we see here in John chapter 12. All of the men go in one area. Sometimes if it's at a family reunion, all the men will maybe go into the living room. Some families, they, they'll put on a football game and they're watching that. Others may go out in the backyard. If they're grilling out on the, on the back porch, they'll go out there. They'll have fellowship. Some of them may go out there in the garage and look at the, the latest trends on their cars. Whatever the thing is, wherever the men are, that's where all the men go. Why? Because they want to have fellowship with each other. But where the men are, the women are not going to be women. They'll probably be in the living room. They'll be in the kitchen. Whatever the case may be. Preparing food. Uh, doing the finishing touches on the meal. And uh, we, we see the reason why we call them women. Because you take one bite of the delicious food they prepare and all you can say is, whoa man, that tastes really good. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam took one look at Eve and said, whoa man. And the name has stayed throughout all of eternity. But when you look at verse 3 in John chapter 12, we see the story of Mary. Mary had a worship for Jesus like no one else. Instead of serving Jesus food and enjoying a conversation with Jesus, we see that Mary wanted to demonstrate her worship and her devotion in a more dramatic way, in a more passionate way. I want to stop here and tell you for just a moment that, and recognize that there are different ways in which people worship. There are different ways in which people honor Jesus. 
Even in a regular church service setting, there are different ways in which people honor the Lord. Not everybody's going to shout. Not everybody's going to cry. Some people weep. Some people kneel. Some people stand. Some people lift up their hands and worship. We saw a good example of that here Sunday night as the Holy Spirit began to take over the service and people were weeping. Some were at the altar. Some were kneeling back at their seats. The Holy Spirit was doing a work in our lives. But everybody was worshiping in their own way. But also at the same time, everyone was worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so Mary was worshiping at a different level. See, Martha and Lazarus loved Jesus, and for them, their response was normal. You would expect someone to, to worship in a way where they're serving and they're working. People worship by doing work in the church, and they're serving in the church. They're preparing meals. They're driving buses. They're, they're, they're cleaning the church. That's one way that we show our worship. Other people worship by wanting to just be in the presence of God. And... and there's nothing wrong with wanting to serve in the church physically. There's nothing wrong with wanting to serve in the church spiritually where you just want to come and you just want to be in fellowship with God. But Mary had a different experience. Mary's experience went way beyond what everyone else has done. The Bible tells us that she took a pound of spike that's made from a spice from a plant that grows in India. And the Bible says that she anoints his feet and wipes his feet with her hair, and the odor of the ointment filled the house. Now notice several things about what Mary did in anointing Jesus. She gave her best to Jesus. The Bible tells us that this ointment was very valuable. In fact, it says that it was worth about the same amount that an average worker would make in an entire year. Put that in today's standard. The average worker in the United States makes an average salary of 25000 or more. So that's about how much that small bottle of ointment was that Mary broke and poured out on Jesus' feet. It's very expensive, very valuable. And Jesus tells us in verse 7 that she had been keeping this for the day that Jesus would be buried. And she poured out with total abandon the most valuable, the most precious possession that she had. She gave it all to Jesus. That's how much she loved him. How much do we love Jesus? How much are we willing to give Him? Many people today, they claim to follow Jesus, but they never come to know Him to the degree that they're willing to give Him the best part of their life. They're not willing to give Him their children to serve in ministry or on the mission field. They're not willing to even give one-tenth of their, their, their tithe and offering to Him. Let me stop right there for just a second. A tithe is not a suggestion, but it's a requirement in the Word of God. A lot of people claim to love Jesus, but they don't define love the same way that Jesus defines love. Jesus tells us that if we love Him, we must keep His commandments. And He also says, No greater love has any man than this, that He would lay down His life for His friends. Jesus laid down His life. He gave all that He had for you and for me. What are we willing to give to Him? What are we willing to do to worship Him and to honor Him and to glorify Him? Have we given Him the best that we have? If we haven't, what does that say about how much we really love Him? Not only did Mary give her best to Jesus, but she was also willing to humble herself in order to honor Him. See, it's impossible for us to honor God and to maintain a sense of self-importance at the same time. We must get ourselves out of the way. Get our own thoughts, get our pride, get our self-ambition out of the way so that we can bring honor to Jesus. John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. Jesus must become greater, I must become less. See, Mary worshipped Jesus in a way like that. See, to pour this precious ointment on the feet of Jesus was one thing. But then to take her very own hair and wipe that oil off of the feet of Jesus. That's a different scenario altogether. See, one Bible commentator states that a woman's hair is her glory. You know what that means? Mary was laying her glory at the feet of Jesus. 
She was laying her pride. She was laying all that she was worth without respect of what other people in the room thought about her. She was giving it all to Jesus. She was worshiping Him. She was honoring Him in total humility with her life. And I believe with all my heart that when we come to Jesus Christ and begin to worship Him for who He really is, that He will humble us. And we begin to pour our heart out to Him and to worship Him in spirit and truth. When we know Him, coming into His presence will be no ordinary thing. Worshiping Him ascribes the glory and the honor to Him that He alone is to. It will not be something that we do as a matter of routine. When we begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth, we don't have to worry about coming to church and, and going through the motions and following this program or that program. But when we begin to worship Him and put Jesus Christ first place and center in our life, it makes no difference what we may have prepared at choir practice. It makes no difference what we may have planned on doing in the service. The Holy Spirit knows what we have need of before we ever think and begin to ask about it. And so the Holy Spirit begins to take over. But if we will let the Holy Spirit take charge, God will lead us, God will direct us, and He will do what no other power on this earth can do. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, when Satan was tempting Jesus, the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In Psalms chapter 66, verse 14, the psalmist said, All the earth shall worship thee and shall cling unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. In Psalms 95, verse 6 through 7, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, in Psalms 99, verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. In John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 through 11, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created my prayer and heart's desire is that as we come together for worship here in the sanctuary at How Assembly of God, that, that it will not be church as usual, that, that it, it, our worship will get to a point of where it makes no difference who sits beside us or behind us or in front of us. It makes no difference what song is being sung. That if we would just tune our mind into God and tune our hearts into Him and just come into this house and begin to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth and begin to let the love of God show forth in our life. I believe we would see revival break out in our lives and we would see revival break out through this church from one side of this church to the other and this revival would sweep across this community but it begins when we begin to humble ourselves before God because if we will humble ourselves before Him, He will lift us up. If we wait upon Him, the Bible says, and I say it, the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We wait upon Him in the presence of the Lord. When we wait upon Him, He will come unto us and He will meet us where we are. And we begin to pour our heart out to Him and begin to cry out to Him and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive blessing and honor and glory and power, for He has created all things, and for His pleasure they are and were created. Have you ever been so overwhelmed by the power of God that all you could do is just shed tears and weep? Have you ever been so overwhelmed in the power of God that you fall down upon your face and begin to weep and to groan and to cry out to the Lord? Have you ever felt Him in such a powerful way that He drives you to your knees? Have you ever felt like Isaiah when He came into the presence of God and He said, 
Woe is me, for I am undone. That is exactly where Mary was. It's the very presence of God afforded her an opportunity to worship that was intensely personal and experientially powerful. See, the interesting thing was, while Mary was worshiping, while Mary was pouring her heart out to God, she was consumed with a passion to honor Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The other people in the room didn't understand what she was doing. They thought it was foolish of her to pour that ointment out on the feet of Jesus. So why is it that people out in the world can go to a football game and, and watch a football game on television and they shout and they cheer and they make a fool out of themselves when their team's losing. But if someone shouts in church, they get criticized. They get talked about. Some people may say, well, I wish that person wouldn't shout so much in church. I'm trying to hear what song the choir is. I wish that person wouldn't be so loud. I wish, I wish they would sit down instead of getting up and raising their hands because I'm trying to see what's going on. We need to forget about all of that. We need to let God have His way. We need to let people worship. Yeah, sometimes I've been in a church service where you're sitting shoulder to shoulder and all of a sudden someone begins to dance and shout in the Spirit. They just about knock everybody over. If it bothers you, sit somewhere else. Amen. That's all I've got to say about it. If it bothers you, sit somewhere else. Let God have His way in their life. Amen. Because if all you're doing is worrying about some kind of a distraction that you think is going on because someone is letting God have His way, you don't know what that person's been through. You don't know the troubles they face. You don't know the sorrow that they've been through. And you don't know what God has done in their life to redeem them. They may have a reason to shout. They may have a reason to jump. They may have a reason to, to run the aisles. You don't know their story, but the Turn the situation around. A lot of people don't know your story. A lot of people don't know how God has brought you through. A lot of people don't know. And so that's why the Word of God says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If God has done something for you, tell somebody about it. If God has saved you, let this world know. If God has delivered you, if God has set you free, tell somebody about it. Amen. Remember the story in Acts chapter 3. The man who sat lame at the gate of the temple. When Peter and John laid hands upon him and healed him, he wasn't quiet about it. The Bible says he went walking and leaping and praising God. What would happen here at Howe Assembly if on any given worship service, right in the middle where, where it's a, a quiet time, all of a sudden someone begins to get a, a touch of the Holy Spirit and they begin to receive a healing in their life and they re begin to receive strength in their bones and all they can do to contain themselves is just to leap up on their feet and begin to yell a hallelujah, thank you Jesus. I've been healed. I've been set free. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. What would it happen? What would happen if we began to worship God in a way like no one else? Mary worshipped in spite of the criticism. In verse 4, the Bible says that Judas Iscariot, the one who had betrayed Jesus, accused Mary of wasting her precious ointment. He claimed that this ointment could have been used and sold and the money used to give to the poor. Judas didn't care about the poor. The Word of God clearly tells us that all Judas was interested in was money. And that was his weakness. He had a desperate love for money. He loved money more than he loved Jesus. He wasn't interested in giving money to the poor. Judas was the treasure. He had the money back. He knew how much money was in there. He knew how much money was left. He knew how much he wanted. And so he was thinking, that's more money. We could have used that. I could have used that. That's probably what he was saying. He's like, I could have used that money. I could have gone out and bought whatever I wanted. But no, she had to break that on Jesus' feet and waste it. Wasted it all. And Satan used that. That was his weakness. And we see that weakness when Satan used Judas to betray Jesus with 30 pieces of silver. See, there's always going to be somebody around that tells us, that we're wasting our time. We're wasting our money. We're wasting the best that we have to give. Don't let them stop. You worship God anyhow. You praise God anyhow. Don't let this world 
criticize you. Don't let this world stop you. I told the choir Sunday night at choir practice. I said, we're up here to worship. We're not up here to put on a show. We're not up here to put on a concert. Don't worry about what people think. We're not here to please the people. We're here to please God. And if God is pleased with our worship, mission accomplished. Nothing else matters. Don't be a people pleaser, but be a God pleaser. Please the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Because when, when we've given all of our worship to Him, that's all that matters. God is the one that makes the difference. Mary worshiped despite this criticism. When you worship God in a way like Mary did, what other people says does not matter. All that matters is that you demonstrate the love that you have for Jesus Christ from within the depths of your heart. We need to quit worrying about what other people think. There's a lot of churches today that have altered the worship services so that they're not offensive to the lost. It's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Afraid of offending people who are unsaved by the way that we worship. See, worship is not for the lost. They do not even know the one that we worship. But worship is the song of the redeemed. Worship is the song of those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Worship is something that you and I do for God's pleasure with that respect of what other people think about us or how they might judge us. Mary was a good example. She worshipped despite the criticism. She worshipped regardless of the cost. She didn't care what other people thought. She didn't care how public it was or how much it might humiliate her. But she was there to worship Jesus. And she poured out everything she had and she did not let anything or anyone get in her way. But there's another thing I want us to notice about Mary's worship. In verse 3 it says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment a spike, very costly. And she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And look at this part, it says, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Her worship filled the house. The ointment that she poured out got into everything. It saturated her hair. It was on the feet of Jesus. It was probably all over the floor. It probably got in their clothes. See, that's what true worship does. When you get in love with Jesus Christ and we begin to worship Him and you begin to pour your heart and soul out to Him, worship is going to fill the room. You're going to hear praises of people. You're going to hear loud noises of people worshiping the Lord. You're going to see tear stains all over the Psalter. You're going to see Kleenexes thrown on the floor. Why? Because people are worshiping. The Holy Spirit was touching their lives. That's what worship is all about. Worship takes place. True worship happens when you don't care what people think about you. True worship happens when all you want to do is worship Him in spirit and in truth. When you're in love with Jesus, the aroma of that love and that worship will fill the room. We need to honor Jesus whenever the opportunity is at hand. Verse 7 and 8, Jesus corrects Judas and He tells them that this... That, that the poor would be with them always, but they would only have Him for a short time. Jesus is telling us that we need to honor Him. We should worship Him whenever the opportunity presents itself. He's speaking about the spontaneous nature of worship. Worship is not prepared. Worship is not planned. But worship comes from deep within our heart. We can have songs that we prepare to sing. We can have uh, verses that we plan to read. But worship happens when you forget about what you've planned. You forget about everything else, but you just begin to worship Him. You begin to sing what's on your heart. You begin to pray and you begin to worship and, and give praises to God. See, God wants our love. He wants our worship to be from our heart. He wants us to be passionate about loving Him and honoring Him and giving to Him and following Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our minds. Does Jesus get glory and honor in our life? Is He honored in our home? Is He honored at our dinner table? Is He honored by the things that we watch on television? Is He honored by the conversations that we have in our household? 
See, a lot of times at church, it's easy to put on a show for other people to see and to make everyone think that, well, we're just a passionate worshiper, that we're just on fire for God. We may fool people at church. We may fool people out on the street. But God knows the truth. You know the truth. And Satan sees what you're doing too. That's where he finds your weakness. That's how he found Judas's weakness. See, what we need to do is make Jesus Christ the unseen guest at all times. I heard one preacher, I see this preaching, I think it was Brother Brank. He got up to preach one night and he also put a chair out beside him. And he said, this chair is to be symbolic of the presence of God. He's our guest of honor. Whenever you're living your life, whatever activity we're working on, whatever we're doing, when we're on the job, when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're just around the house, look at that empty chair beside you and imagine for a second, what if Jesus was sitting in that chair? Let me give you a heads up on that. He already sees what you're doing. He already knows. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows. But figuratively speaking, imagine Jesus sitting there physically and being there, watching what you do. Are you glorifying Him? Are you lifting up His name? Would He be pleased with the way that you're living? We need to make a practice in our life of communion with Him by spending time in prayer and a study of the Word of God. People in this world that are dealing with situations, they're dealing with addictions, they're dealing with problems in their life, and they're trying to figure out how they can overcome that. How do we overcome sin? We get into the Word of God. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against God. If we want to overcome sin, we want to overcome a problem, get into the Word of God. Spend time in prayer. Because the more time that we spend with Jesus, the less time Satan has an opportunity to try to infiltrate the junk of this world into your life. Make it a practice in your life to talk to others about Jesus. One of the ways that we bring glory and honor to Him, one of the ways that we worship Him, is by telling other people about Jesus. Invite someone to church. Invite someone to an outreach event. Encourage somebody. Invite someone to, to go eat with you after church. Ask God to open your spiritual eyes and the opportunities so that you can see how Jesus can be honored in your life, in your home, in your everyday experience. Because when you begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth, when you begin to praise Him, we used to sing a song years ago when I taught you at the church, the prayers go up and the blessings come down. When we offer up our prayers of thanksgiving, our sacrifice of praise, He's going to pour His Spirit out upon you. If you need God's Holy Spirit to flood into your life, first of all, you've got to let the prayers go up. You know what? Before the rain can come down, first of all, there's some evaporation that has to go up. This earth has to offer up the moisture that it has so a fresh rain can begin to fall down. That's what we need to do in our life. We need to let the old staleness go back up. We need to get rid of everything that's in our life. Send it up and let God send down a fresh outpouring. Let God send a new shower of blessing in our life. Because when we worship Him in spirit and in truth, Jesus can turn our life around and He can strengthen us and recharge us and set us on the, the, the pathway of victory in our life. And He will guide us and direct us in the ways of righteousness. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Let's worship Him in spirit and in truth. Can we stand across this sanctuary? Father, we thank You tonight for all that You have done. And God, we thank You that You came into this world. You humbled Yourself to come to this world and experience the death on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we pray that You will help us, Lord, to surrender our will and our life to You. Help us, Lord, to surrender our thoughts, all that we are, to You, God. And Lord, help us to worship You and to honor You and to serve You with all of our heart, with all of our soul and our mind, all of the days of our life, Jesus. And God, we give You the praise for it in Jesus' name. All across the sanctuary, let's find a place 
where we can pray and get in touch with God and let's worship Him and let's honor Him and let's seek the face of God and ask Him, Lord, help me to be a better worshiper. Help me to serve You in a better way. Help me, God, to honor You in all that I do. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Lord, help us, Father, to worship You. Help us, Lord, to surrender our will to You, Jesus. Help us, God, to be what You have called us to be, to do what You have called us to do. God, help us to serve You with all of our heart, with all of our soul and our mind, Jesus. Lord, help us worship You in our singing. Help us to worship you through our study of the Word of God. God, help us to worship you by praying for lost souls. Help us to worship you by working in the outreach. Help us to worship you by bringing people to church. Help us to worship you by our giving. Help us to worship you, Father, in every way that we can. God, let there be no limit in our life of how we can worship you. But God, help us, Lord, to give our all to you. Help us, Lord, to pour out our worship to you, unmeasured, broken and spilled out for you, Jesus. Lord, let our worship, God, saturate our environment. Let our worship, God, Lord, let our worship be poured out for you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all that you Lord, let us never take for granted the blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary. Let us never take for granted your grace and your mercy. But Lord, help us to always be thankful. Help us, Lord, to always love you and to serve you. Help us, Lord, to always follow you in spirit and in truth, Jesus. Father, I pray that you will use this church, God, Lord, the spirit of unity that we sense so real in service after service, God, that you would use this church, Lord, to turn this community upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we pray that there will be souls that are saved, people that are set free, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let sinners come to an altar of prayer and repent of their sins. Give their life over to you, Jesus. Lord, let those who are broken in their life, let those who are empty, God, let those who are hungry come in and be filled to the utmost of your anointing and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The evidence is speaking in other tongues. God, we pray that you would send revival to this community, that you would send a revival to this church, God, that we would see souls saved, that, that lost would come home, that our sons and daughters would come home, that our grandchildren would come home, that our moms and dads and our grandparents would come home to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, you've done so many great things in this church, God. There's been great revivals in this church. But God, we're still believing for more souls to be saved. We're still believing, God, for that lost son, for that lost daughter to come home to know you, Jesus. Grant it, dear Lord, we pray. Lord, there's no limit to your power. Lord, remove every obstacle. Lord, remove our pride. Remove our dignity. Lord, we lay it all at your feet, Jesus. We lay it all at your feet, Jesus. We pour it all out to you, God. We give it all to you. Lord, our unsaved family, our unsaved loved ones, our unsaved co-workers, God, we pour them out to you, Jesus. Lord, we pour out the broken pieces to you. We surrender it all to you. Lord, we ask that you bend the broken heart, that you fill the lost to the empty. Lord, that you do a work, God, like no other power in this world could do. Lord, you are the Alpha, you are the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's no one else like you, Jesus. Lord, you're our only hope. 
You're the source of our strength and the strength of our life. We trust you, Father. We depend upon you. We stand upon your word. For God, your word is true. Your word is holy. Your word is enough, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040. Sunday evenings at 6 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.